Hi everyone and welcome to episode number 15 of the Fandom Science Podcast. As you can tell by the title, today's episode is on weight cutting in mixed martial arts and its impact on performance. And to talk about that, I'm joined by Dr. Oliver Barley, who is a sports scientist and an exercise physiologist from Edith Cowan University in Australia. So for the first 15 minutes of today's episode, Oliver and I broke down UFC 249. We talked a little bit about the fights that we saw and what we liked from them. And then after the 15 minute mark onwards, we got to the hardcore scientific talk. And so we talked about which attributes of performance are most affected by weight cutting and which attributes are not. We also talked about dehydration techniques that fighters use to cut weight and how they can be dangerous to their health, but also how they can hinder their performance in the octagon. Uh, We also talked about what physiological changes take place in the fighters' bodies during the weight cut process and finally we talked about some ways that we can mitigate weight cutting how we can make it perhaps safer for the athletes uh, in a way that optimizes their health but also their performance inside the octagon so i hope you guys enjoy this episode and if you do as always please consider leaving a like and subscribe to the channel for more interesting episodes coming soon thank you so much enjoy first and foremost i want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me today um, before we jump into any of the hardcore, you know, physiology and all that stuff, I want to get your thoughts on UFC 249 that we just saw a couple of days ago. I mean, we're not going to jump into science without talking about that. Come on. Uh, I, I know it's, um, first of all, thanks for having me. And, um, secondly, one, I, w- I was quite happy to see some live sport. It, it, it had got to the point where someone could have done, you know, live extreme noughts and crosses and i would have been going oh finally <laughs> um but it it was it was such a stacked card and it, it was it was awesome to see i think um the, the best part for me had to have been justin gaethje had what must have been the perf- performance of his life you know i i um on, on a shorter camp as well and it was just such a, and the way he listens to his coaches and it was, yeah, it was just, it was just fantastic. It was such an excellent fight. The way he rallied back from getting dropped in the second as well and just kind of gets up, comes in the next round and just continues to put a beating on Tony. It was, it was incredible. Um, it was great Ngani to see was how, just fun. Oh, but before we get to Ngani, which was nuts, yeah. Um, yeah. it was just great to see Gaethje develop from like a brawler from his first fight in UFC, you know, a guy who was reckless to this guy that we saw on Saturday night. I think that was, that was a night and day, the difference. Yeah. And that's one thing I think is that's a good demonstration of really high level fighters. And it's something that we, I actually, upon reflection, I don't think we see it as much as we probably should, which is, athletes that are making very large changes throughout their career based on their, their failures. Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot, a lot of fighters kind of have the, this is what I do. This is how I do it. Okay. We'll see how much success I have with that. And maybe I'll get better at what I do, but it's quite rare that we see, um, fighters have basically entire flipping the scripts of their, their approach and really harnessing what they do well, but also really, Gaethje, you know, the, the mythical patient Gaethje is so much more versatile. And those two losses um, to Alvarez and Poirier might have been the best things that ever happened to him because he's just taken them and, and learned. And the version of Gaethje now, it's funny because I was saying this to um, the few guys I was watching it with. Um, I've been saying this for, for months now that... I honestly think Gaethje is a harder matchup for Khabib than Tony because I didn't see, honestly, I didn't see Tony's pathway to victory versus Khabib. People were describing to me a lot of low probability stuff of, oh, Khabib takes him down and then Tony cuts him off his back and gets a doctor's stoppage or Tony Imanari rolls him and gets a submission. I'm like, none of that seems like particularly high likelihood stuff considering how good Khabib is at position before well, not necessarily position before submission, but position before punching you in the face repeatedly until he, he gets the submission. Yeah. I really didn't see a clear path for Tony to do it. But Gaethje, uh, abs- absolutely, an NCAA Div 1 All-American who's wrestled against Jordan Burroughs, if I'm remembering correctly, and I don't think he won that match, but even still, stopping a couple of Burroughs t- double legs is a, a feat of its own. 
he's got that wrestling experience. He's got, and his striking, obviously, he would be able to outstrike Khabib. And that makes a really interesting fight because Khabib has gone into a division filled with strikers. It's a, he hasn't, I'm, I, I can't recall a person, and maybe I'm just forgetting someone, but I'm pretty certain that he hasn't faced someone in the UFC with a legitimate wrestling pedigree. Khabib? He's not faced. Yeah, Khabib. Hmm. Who has he fought that someone? I don't think anybody that would come to close to Gaethje's pedigree in wrestling. No. And that's because I remember I, I, I went over it with someone the other day and he's faced a lot of strikers and a lot of, you know, brawlers and he hasn't really faced someone with a legit NCAA Div 1 pedigree of wrestling. And the thing is, Khabib tires as well. Like we see Khabib start to slow down in the fourth and fifth, but it's a war of attrition. He'll spend a lot of energy to take you down and you'll spend even more energy trying to stop him. But the thing is, if you've got Gaethje's NCAA Div 1 pedigree, he's going to make Khabib spend a lot more energy to get him down and he's going to be really good at getting back up effectively. So my question, and he's got cardio for days, especially as the mythical patient Gaethje, that he, it really seems possible to me that he could make Khabib overwork and land his big shots and again, just accumulate damage to the point where Khabib gets tired and then he ultimately gets to finish him with strikes. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying I can see a very clear and realistic path for Gaethje to win that fight. And that, that to me is, is, is really exciting. And one of the things when I know a lot of people were sad that Tony and Khabib isn't going to happen right away because it's, it's still ultimately might. Tony's not far away from a title shot if he comes back and gets a good win on his, on his way back. But um, I'm honestly, you know, a few, a, one of the guys I watched it with was really sad when it was over because he's like, no, Tony and Khabib is, is gone forever. And I'm like, honestly, I know it's gone, but we got a pretty good consolation prize here which is a probably Khabib's hardest test I think when, when I was watching that fight and especially towards the end of it when it was clear that Gaethje is you know on his way to a win um, I just started to realize slowly like Gaethje and Khabib is the fight that we never knew we wanted but is exactly mm. what what should happen like until, Honestly, until I'm, that I'm, moment you never realize that this is yeah, the fight I, well, I'm feeling so much vindication because for months I've been saying to my group of friends, guys, Gage, Gaethje's the guy. I want to see Gaethje fight him. Everyone's like, oh, I don't care about Gaethje. I'm like, come on. Look, I'm, I've been making this case and I've had everyone go, no, nah, no, nah, Tony's the guy to beat him. And now that this has happened, I'm just going, oh, Connor, please do not somehow steal that fight and beat Gaethje because I need to see it. Um, yeah. But, uh, but it was an excellent fight. Probably the second best fight I've seen this year after um, Joanna and Wiley Zhang's fight. That was a great one. Um, I was just last night on Fight Pass watching the all the top ten fights from twenty nineteen. Uh, relived like Kamaru Usman versus Colby, you know, and all those ones. That was an interesting fight. Yeah. What, what did you think of Ngannou? It it was funny because like I, I come from initially a kickboxing background, so I was initially when I watched it. I was like, it reminded me of the scene in The Simpsons where Bart is going, I'm just going to do this with my arms, I'm just flailing his arms around, and I'm going to walk at you, and if you get caught, it's your own fault. Like That's a signature you know, he, move. Yeah, but the, the thing was, Rosenstroke actually did a fairly decent job because he avoided, what, like five or six punches in a row using his footwork and head movement. And Nganu was doing, like, technically speaking, it, it didn't look very good. But the problem is when you've got the power of the sun in both of your hands, like, he just hits him so hard. It was one punch that landed. And Rosenstruck, just the windows shutting down music plays. And he's just out. And, and out that, for a while. Oh, oof, I know. And that, that raises a really interesting, I guess it raises a weird question of where Steve, uh, not Steve, uh, Steve, where Nganu kind of fits in all of this because he definitely has demonstrated growth since his loss to Stipe. Um, but I guess the problem is it's kind of how much growth because really he had that, that boring fight with Lewis and then after that he had his, his kind of resurgence but it was for the most part just absolutely starching dudes that I haven't really had, you know, he's consistently, we've seen him throw a few kicks against Dos Santos. 
Um, apparently he's working his cardio a lot more, but I've never really, I, I've heard a lot of this, but I haven't really had the opportunity to see a lot of it because no one can really last long enough. No, he, he had four first round finishes in a row. Yeah. I think his total time in the cage in those past four fights was like two minutes and 30 seconds or something. So yeah. we don't really have a lot to work with. And I don't know if, you know, if DC and Stipe happens again and let's almost regardless if St- if DC wins, he'll retire. And then I imagine Stipe would then fight Ngannou for the vacant belt. Or, you know, if Stipe wins, then I imagine Ngannou would be his next test. I know Ngannou was hinting that he wanted someone who he hadn't fought before, which would have been insinuating Curtis Blades. But that's a hard sell for me, considering Ngannou's on a four-fight win streak. And one of those is a vicious KO of Blades. It's, you know, it's a hard sell to then argue that Blades should get the shot. But I don't know what Stipe would, uh, what Ngannou would do different, because the first fight he almost murdered Stipe with a one, well, a couple really good shots. Stipe weathered the storm and then wrestled him for a while and, and got the victory. I'm just not sure that we would see anything different the second time. But I, I don't know. He apparently he's been doing a lot of work, so maybe. Well, at the time, it seemed like he's never taken a wrestling class in his life when he fought yeah. Stipe the first time. And so I think that was like a year and a half, maybe two years ago, something like that. So Yeah, and the hope is he's been using those camps for cons- for growth. Yeah, but Even though he hasn't got to demonstrate it, the hopefully each camp, you know, his wrestling's got a little bit better. His grappling's got a little bit better. His um, cardio's getting better and better, and they're really trying to work. Hopefully all those things are working and he's not just relying on the success he's been having. And, you know, he's got smart people around him. So I expect that must be the case. I would hope so. I mean, I would, I would like to see him as a champ one day. Yeah. Well, it seems almost inevitable. Um, yeah. And I, I know obviously there's um, a chance that Jones is going to move up to heavyweight. I know he's recently been teasing that he wants a 220 fight before he goes up. But honestly, I'm not that convinced that Jones would be that successful at heavyweight. Um, you yeah, know, he's, he's, had tro- he's had trouble with guys with good fundamental striking. And, you know, the, the Santos fight, arguably he lost that fight. Um, the Don I fight had too. his... Well, the what fight, sorry? The last fight Dom against fight. Dominic, yeah. I, I scored Dom winning that fight. Mm-hmm. So I, I had the first three rounds pretty clearly for Dom and the last two for Jones. So, you know, I, I don't see how... I worry that if Jones was standing across from, you know, Alistair Overeem, you know, Overeem had, you know, there's been some talk about his chin being a bit suspect, but John doesn't really have that, like, flash one knockout power. No. And Overeem's got excellent technical striking that I don't like that matchup for John Curtis blades. I don't like a big strong man wrestle and mixing up the wrestling with pretty decent fundamental striking. I don't like that matchup for John either in Garnu fills me with horror because Jones gets hit quite a lot and you, you can't get hit by in That's, no. that's unacceptable. So I, I, to me, it looks like heavyweight is, is really dangerous for him and maybe he wants that challenge, but, He's got challenges at light heavyweight now because he needs to, I think he needs to be rematching Reyes or if they want to do someone else, he's got to fight Jan whilst um, Santos and Reyes fight each other for the next shot. But he's, um, it's, it's an, I don't, I don't know what he wants to do and I suspect he'll probably stay at light heavyweight because he's been teasing this heavyweight move for what? four years now so. he's been talking about it for a while but the thing is like about the the layout of the ufc and his status to john jones if he moves up he's not fighting you know he's not fighting like blades and those guys he's he's fighting the champ yeah right away. to be honest i think his best matchup at of the major heavyweights might actually be stipe um which is not to say that he's going to start stipe but you know stipe in the dc in the second dc fight struggled with the hand tracing like the mummy hands of walking for him and blocking it which jones does that a lot and jones has the range and really stipe was consistently losing that second fight even though it was competitive in my in my view he was losing until the point that he punched dc in the tummy and 
DC couldn't work out how to actually deal with it. So he just got his belly rubbed until he <laughs> fell over and it was over. So <laughs> I, I, but I don't think Jones would, would fall for that. So it would almost look like Jones might just mummy hands him, pepper him with a couple of shots and oblique kicks for 25 minutes and then get an unsatisfying decision. Um, that's very I, possible. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I'd like to see it, obviously, and I'd buy that pay per view. But, but then honestly, I, I, the problem is, I I think Jones's hardest heavyweight fights, as I said, are actually probably outside of the belt. So it would be him getting the belt and then trying to defend it, unless he pulls a GSP, gets the belt, and then just vacates and retires and goes, "There you go, two division champ, put me down as the greatest of all time." I think that's most likely the scenario, to be honest. I don't see him, you know, yeah. sticking around and defending it and going through the list, the contenders. I don't I don't no. see that for him. I don't, I don't see it either, but maybe. So, speaking of, and this is the topic of today's podcast, but this is a perfect segue because what we saw um, on Saturday with Gaethje versus Tony, um, and for everybody that doesn't know what happened, the UFC 249 was supposed to happen April 18th. And then obviously the card got canceled because of COVID. Um, but Tony, being Tony, continued his weight cut because that's just the kind of guy he is. Um, he continued his weight cut. He still made weight even though there's no fight happening. Only for him to cut weight again three weeks later for mm. the past weekend, right? To compete against Gaethje. Mm. A lot of people, uh, Dana White included, said that this has got to factor in in the result of the fight. So what do you think about that? Do you think his weight cut affected how he looked? Because he had cut weight twice? To be honest, no. Which is, I guess, a, a position that a lot of people probably wouldn't expect me to have a, a weight cutting researcher who's usually talking about how bad weight cutting is. But um, it, it ultimately, I guess, it depends how much he cut weight by. But... There were three weeks between those gap and between, you know, the gap between him losing that weight and him fighting again. And I think it's easy when you watch something to afterwards have a bit of sampling bias and go, oh, he did this thing oh, and he lost. Let's connect those lines. And weight cutting, or uh, as we'll probably end up getting into later, definitely... Um, almost definitely, well, definitely affects physical performance. Whether it affects MMA success is a bit of a different question. But it, with a three-week recovery, I, d- I wouldn't expect really any residual effects to be remaining after that. But the question then becomes, if he did that weight cut, did he get, I would imagine he would get lower quality training for at least a few days after that, which then is obviously going to affect his training load and training adaptations and, and all that. So it might have some kind of uh, ripple effect like that. But I, I probably wouldn't imagine that three weeks later there would have, unless it was an unbelievably brutal weight cut. But from from what I've heard, Tony doesn't actually sit that far away from 155. So I can't imagine it would have been anything so extreme that it would reasonably be a problem three weeks later. I think I, the, the thing is with that fight, I think it was just, Gaethje had the perfect fight all except for five seconds where he, he went for a, a weird sloppy uppercut and just got clipped in the second. But um, it is weird that Tony would decide to do that weight cut. And I think it's, it's definitely not a smart move. Um, and it probably would have hindered his training for at least a couple of days after. But I wouldn't expect there was like a direct kind of one for one effect there. And I think if Tony hadn't have done that, we probably would have seen the exact same fight, um, or at least a, a very, a, oops, sorry, a very similar fight. Um, if anything, the a bigger effect probably would have been the fact that he'd been preparing for Khabib for so long, and it, you know you're preparing for getting the smash, and then you face a guy who's NCAA Div One but does hasn't done a takedown in you know, ten years in a cage, yeah, but and, and will not ever. No, I, I sincerely doubt it. If he fights Connor, I hope he polishes his wrestling up and gives him a little bit of wrestling at least to mix it up. But I doubt it. I sincerely doubt it. Although Connor's takedown defense isn't too bad either. I mean, it's, no, it's, it's, it's definitely good. respectable. Yeah. 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 Um, so, okay. 
Th- that's interesting. Yeah, like you said, I wasn't uh, I wasn't expecting you to say that about Tony's weight cut, but that makes sense. Uh, so mm. from the papers that I've been reading, um, a lot of them are yours and, and also ones that you've cited in your work. Studies are so conflicting on this. Some say weight cutting does impact performance. Some say they it doesn't. Where's the truth in there from your knowledge, from your expertise? Yeah, so it's a it's a really weird topic and it's a difficult thing to try and hammer down. And one of the easiest distinctions to make first is you're, you're asking, there, there's two distinct questions to get asked in that, which is the, the first one being, does um, weight cutting affect performance? And what you mean by, perf- what that person means by performance is winning a fight. But the problem is, the factors that go into winning a fight are numerous. That you know, there's the stylistic matchup, the, the skills, your conditioning, um, the the tactical approach that you take, just randomness of fighting, and that creates a lot of noise when we look at this data. So, for example, you could see um, Jorge Masvidal flying kneeing Ben Askren, and someone could take that and maybe look at the amount of weight they cut and go, "Oh, look, Ben cut more weight than." Jorge looks like weight cutting did that, but the problem is it's no Jorge flying need him in the head in four seconds. It's maybe even a bit less than that. And it's very difficult then to determine why people are winning and losing because there's so many factors that go into it. And that's probably one of the biggest problems when we do studies when, and those aren't, this typically hasn't been the approach I've taken with my research but you, you can obviously get ones where you track the amount of weight that someone loses and the amount of weight that someone regains. And you do that for a lot of people. And then you look at their competitive outcomes and you try and work out relationships. And that's certainly a valid approach. Um, but obviously, it's created a lot of mixed results. Now, one thing we do seem to see when we look at it across sports, so a bit of a more general trend, which is weight cutting does, there are there is probably more data for than against suggesting that weight cutting is associated with a positive effect on performance to a certain level in grappling based sports, but in striking based sports, there's probably more evidence to suggest that it doesn't actually benefit. And that when you instinctively think about it, that kind of makes sense that in grappling, obviously the weight that you have is weight that your opponent has to carry or weight that your opponent has to deal with, whereas striking not so much. Um, but even that data is extremely messy. And when we look at MMA, there are some, some newer studies, which do seem to show kind of a Goldilocks zone where people are more likely to win if they lose a bit of weight, but they're more likely to lose if they lose a lot of weight. But even then there's a lot of debate around this data. The, The approach I've typically taken is the second meaning of the word performance, which would be we take certain aspects of physical performance that we know would be important to MMA and we assess that. So, for example, in the the study I published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, we got a repeat effort performance. So we got someone to get a sled that's worth 75% of their their body mass and push it. um, So sprint 10 meters, there's 20 seconds rest, and they do that. 30 times and it takes people about 12 minutes to finish which is comparable length to a three round MMA fight and you end up with a high intensity to low intensity ratio which is one to four ish which is the same as an MMA fight or similar to MMA time motion analysis and we saw that people who cut weight consistently and this was a fairly moderate cut of about 4.5 percent which in pro MMA uh, you know I've seen I've showed, I've talked about that study to people in pro MMA and they've all gone, that's a small weight cut. We're making way bigger ones. So the effect is probably larger in practice, but we see there that it, it very clearly, if you lose a lot of water, a lot of water, a lot of weight via water rapidly, even with 24 hour recovery periods, it does affect your physical ability. The question is, is it worth the trade off? So if you trade off a little bit of your physical ability, is it worth fighting a slightly smaller opponent? I, I, and that's the problem with trying to work out the effect of it on actual performance performance, because again, styles make fights too. So we might see that 
if you're running a bunch of MMA data, maybe cutting more weight is better for wrestling style athletes because it helps them in those grappling exchanges, but it actually doesn't really benefit the striking, st- striking style athletes. But none of that is really getting looked at in these analyses. And it's been one of the reasons why I haven't done a lot of research like that at this point because I look at it and I just think about all the factors that go into it. And we're actually working on a paper right now um, about uh, we're doing a lit review kind of in this area to talk about some of these difficulties. And I've looked at it and thought that's a lot of things to try and control. And I don't know if I can do it properly. So what I've been trying to do really is isolate certain factors that would reasonably affect performance. So I can at least say to someone, um, if you cut more weight, so if you cut 5% of your body mass and then try to put it back on 24 hours later, you will prob- your repeat effort ability will probably be around 10% impaired and they can do what they want with that information, I guess. If they decide, oh, well, actually, I'd, I'd rather that than fight a weight class up, then it's ultimately their call. I think probably the main thing that we can take from a lot of this physical performance data. And if we start to see where it mixes into the correlation data, it's probably somewhere in it's a good idea to cut less weight, but it's probably not the ideal competitive um, strategy to cut exactly zero weight. Um, But again, I I don't a hundred percent know, to be honest, there's a lot more research that needs doing. And we're really only just kind of scratching the surface in this for a problem that's so complicated, you know. That's a, that's a really uh, good point. It's like, yeah, you want to study how much weight cutting affects performance, but a million things go into winning a fight. How how could you possibly pinpoint just weight cutting on its own? Um, yeah, so it's basically th- impossible to isolate. Right. But so other than repeat effort, um, are there any other measurements or like attributes of performance that have been shown to be hindered by weight cutting? Um, so it seems to be, for the most part, longer duration things that are affected by weight cutting. So it probably, from data I've seen and data I've published and all that, it seems that probably markers of strength and power aren't as affected by it, whereas over time because that's one of the things we saw in our study one of the things we saw in our study was that at the start in the weight cut group at the start of their repeat sled push test the results were actually very close they were a little bit slower but not a massive amount and then progressively as you get through the test that gap gets bigger and bigger so the assumption would actually be that i think it's probably more related to time in action so, and there's a, there's a, I'm sure we might later talk about potential mechanisms and everything. Can I, and I can kind of feed into that then, but it seems probably that the longer, if, if your entire game plan is I'm going to KO the guy in the first minute or else I'm definitely going to lose, then chances are that the weight cutting isn't going to be as big a problem. But as the time drags on, it's it's most likely to affect everything. We've seen it to affect um, repeats, so repeat strength ability too. So generating high amounts of force and over over time def- seems to get hindered as well. Um, so perhaps, like so yeah, a, no, sorry. But so perhaps like a third round, a three round fight, yeah, you'll be affected, but not nearly as much as a five round main event or championship fight. Yeah, and I think from what from what we see, and that was the thing we saw in our data was really looking at kind of a th- we could get some indication of what someone would look like over three rounds, and it would look like with the data with the data we collected that someone probably wouldn't be massively affected in that first round, but in the second there'd be a pretty sizable effect, and in the third there'd, there'd be a massive effect. So, in a in a fight, and we don't have data beyond that, but it's a very plausible assumption that it would get worse in the fourth and the fifth. So there's also some data around decision-making, but there's not, it, that's pretty mixed at this point. And I, I published data showing that it didn't seem to affect decision-making at all. 
but there is some other conflicting data that does suggest that it might affect someone's ability to make quick decisions. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not, and again, it's a pretty early field of research and we need to do much more in there, but everything gets worse as time goes on. It would seem the longer you're fighting, the worse it's going to get. Right. And so you just mentioned earlier, um, your study was like four and a half percent or 5% of body mm-hmm. mass being cut. I think, um, I read somewhere it's about like 11% on average is what they're losing. Um, does, does it get that high? It definitely gets that high. The question just comes down to what the actual average is. So I'm actually just flicking through my computer now because I actually have the papers all kind of sitting in front of me, but um, we actually published one in this area. So a, a survey study in this area where we looked at a lot of different fighters and we um looked yeah, at the it average amount like mma yeah it judo, really does seem to vary wrestling. yeah it definitely varies between the sports and in that study we found that consistently mma was worse than everything else they would do they were cutting more weight and they were using the more extreme methods and they were combining methods but the app ab- well yeah yeah the average amount of weight amount of weight usually lost for a competition was 9.8 kilos and their normal walk around weight was about 82. So that, they're, yeah, they're losing over 11. The question is, and this is the problem we need to think about when we look at weight cutting too. And it's something I didn't distinguish as well in this study as I would have liked to, but hindsight's 2020 when you're doing something like this, but is there's a difference between chronic weight cutting and acute weight cutting. I think they both have very, they both have very different mechanisms and different effects. So if you're doing a, um, so for example, in this, these MMA guys, the 9.8 is what they usually lose for competition. But then we asked, asked, what do you usually lose within 24 hours? And that was then 3.4 kilos. So in that 24 hours is probably where we're going to see people doing this, um, the heat exposure and the changes to their body water. And that's what I've focused on a lot more than the more nutrition side of it of, because this is the thing as well to remember for the study, uh, one of the studies I published that I keep referencing, um, they did 4.5% dehydration from fresh. They hadn't been in a horrific diet for two months of constantly in a low, so a negative energy balance. Um, so they, they hadn't have been say having no fiber and, and salt and all these other things in the week up. It was just, they came in a hundred percent fresh, did this cut. Now, typically th- there's still not a massive amount of data in this area and there's, there's a bit of conflicting evidence, but it does seem that when people are doing just the chronic por- portion of the cut, it isn't having massive effects on performance, but it seems to be, mainly around this large water cut towards the end. But the thing we're probably not thinking about because the, the chronic, I, I use the term chronic of what we've done in science very loosely because a lot of those studies are looking at, you know, lose this amount of weight over a week as opposed to, and that's probably the amount of weight they'd lose in 24 hours, but they're giving them a week. So they don't, a lot of them are probably sweating a bit, dieting a bit. Um, but I'm not aware of really good data looking at, say, the combined effects of eight weeks of extremely restrictive eating and then combining it with this effect. Um, and one of the things that we do we do think a lot about when it comes to managing someone's weight is a lot of people think about it in the context of the competition, which is how much, if I cut this much, much weight, am I going to perform when that cage door closes and Bruce Buffer shouts my name? But in terms of the chronic weight cutting, when you've had, you know, one a 24 hours of good refeeding and everything, in terms of glycogen, you might be able to do quite a lot of rebuilding. The question mainly for me becomes, how does that affect your training load over two months? If you're consistently in a negative energy balance, are you getting worse adaptations? Probably. Are you getting more likely to be overtrained? Probably. Are you going to have to reduce your training load as a response to that. Probably are you more likely to get injured almost, almost definitely. So these are 
some of the effects because we've looked at chronic they've looked at chronic weight cutting a bit but it's mainly in response to a single competitive event but i think there's a lot of unanswered questions about how it's going to affect someone's training and that for me is is i guess one of the areas i don't even remember how i got onto this side note but (laughs) No, but so what you're saying, and like the, the, the distinction between chronic and acute is, oh yeah, if a fight camp is about, you know, six to eight weeks. So you mean like mm. when they're in an energy uh, deficiency in the eight mm. weeks, just to like taper off the weight, that's chronic. Yeah. But then the acute is like yep. fight week or maybe like yep. two days, one day before fight yep. day. That's when the hard cut comes. And, and that that's the thing that research is also looked a lot at that kind of hard cut at the end but not a lot at the gradual cut in the lean up in the lead up and that's a really and and but then the thing is we're, we're always trying to isolate things but then we need to think about what happens in reality because in reality the study that i published where people turn up well fed and for people would literally have a big breakfast and then turn up to my study and do the cut that's absolutely not what's happening in the field so I, w- is it going to be much worse when a person who starved themselves then goes through that that huge cut as well? We don't know. And that distinction is quite important to remember and consider as we go through um, because just some areas we haven't looked at nearly as well and some some scientific studies have really not committed to either and thus probably reduced their their effectiveness in that way by kind of taking the amount of weight that someone might typically lose in a single episode in the sauna, but then giving them a week to lose it and then finding, Oh look, there's no effect on performance. And then I've looked at some of those studies and gone, yeah, well, cause they're not losing nearly the amount that they would in that time. You know, cause if we look at the average data we had here, these MMA guys were on average, bearing in mind that's on average, there were a lot of people a lot higher and a lot of people um, lower that's 3.4 kilos of that 82 in 24 hours. But then in two weeks, it's 5.6. So they're, they're losing, they're constantly losing over that time. And what it seems to me is some of them have looked at, have just kind of generally asked how much weight do you cut for a fight? And what that means to the athletes is potentially different. Like I've asked someone, how much weight do you cut? And they've gone, when they hear the word cut, they think about the dehydration and they only mention, yeah, I cut about four kilos. But then if I go, how much weight do you lose for a fight? I've actually done it, not unfortunately not in a scientific study and it's something I do want to do, but I've done it anecdotally, asking people the same question with different words. I've got entirely different answers because if I go, how much weight do you lose for a fight? Then they start to go, I walk around at about 75 and I weigh in at 64. So then I lose this much. And it's actually a a very complicated and segmented process. And unfortunately, from a scientific perspective, initially, I think we've either, we've either over um, isolated it or under isolated it. And it's probably because I don't actually think there's an ideal way to do it. Um, we just have to keep trying to do it in different ways and trying to get together a full picture that we can, because unfortunately, if I track someone's weight cutting through the whole camp, one, if I'm trying to do a scientific study and I just want to look at their physical performance, no one's going to sign up for that study. If I say, hey, I need you to do this physical testing after eight weeks of really savage dieting, and then you're going to do a weight cut as well. No one's going to sign up for it. So then you kind of have to track people doing a real fight. But then when they're doing a real fight, the problem then becomes all the X factors I talked about before. Did we just get a lot of um, strikers matched up with grappling guys on this card? And, it, you know, the, that then messed with all our um, the actual performance outcomes and then screwed with our data. So, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very difficult problem to try and solve. And something that I've, I've put a lot of thought into over years now and unfortunately not come up with an entirely conclusive answer. It's a lot a lot easier to look at it uh, anecdotally. So like I was listening to Kevin Lee the other day uh, in an interview. He said that he walks around usually at 185. He fights at 155. 
So he says, um, from the beginning of the camp, he's 185. When he checks in on Tuesday of fight week, um, he's 176. And so that means from Tuesday until Friday, he's got to go from 176 to 155. It's a lot. And that's something which would be interesting to look at because my data that we collected in this, this survey study was on people of all different competitive levels. The competitive levels were, you know, in the MMA group, 38 people, 38% of the athletes were fighting, had fought at a professional level. Uh, Unfortunately, there was so much data in that study. We could have analyzed it a thousand different ways, but it would have been nice to see just the professional athletes, but I, I think it would be better to do that um, in another study of its own. But I would very strongly expect that those who are fighting professional would be losing far more weight than those that are fighting amateur, um, which is odd because the professionals are the ones who want to have the best performance and they're potentially the ones that are going to get the worst effect from this. So, yeah, and like the stories like Kevin Lee aren't aren't uncommon at all. I remember one image I put up in some presentations I've I've done on this have been the picture of uh, Johnny Hendricks the night of the night before his GSP fight that he'd weighed in at one seventy and I'm pretty sure it was that evening and he was already one eighty six and I think it was one eighty six it was it was high. And he was putting on ridiculous amounts of weight before that fight. And it also raises another question purely of just the ethics of it. As we have these weight classes for a reason, not for a bunch of guys to try and cheese it and get as low as possible so they can fight people smaller than them. And, you know, you look at that, the, the Johnny Hendricks picture of him smiling, going, ah, look how much weight I've put back on. And, I, and I'm kind of thinking, that's not a good thing. It's just all bullshit, doesn't it? Yeah, and then it becomes... It, honestly, when someone says the world's weight champion of the world, I'm like, are you really? <laughs> what are you walking around at? How heavy were you when you won that? No, you... You're you like, 170 for two minutes. Yeah, you're, you're 170 for the period of time that it took you to walk from the sauna in the final stretch to the scales to then drink some water and immediately get heavier again. It's, it's, it's odd. Yeah, Joe Rogan always says it's like... It's like everybody's just pretending. Like you're pretending to be 170. This guy's pretending to be 155. Everybody's pretending to be at a certain weight and it's all um, a mess. So we we yeah. kind of touched on this a little bit briefly, but we mentioned there's different types of weight cutting. There's different methods to it. So can you walk mm-hmm. us through, you know, what methods do fighters use to cut weight? I to guess be honest, chronic and acute. To be, to be honest, like it's one of those things that I'm probably not aware of every method that athletes are using. I get athletes get in touch with me kind of all the time and go, Oh, Hey, have you heard of this method of weight cutting before that my team does? And they describe this really obscure method to me. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never heard of that. And that sounds crazy. <laughs> um, but really it predominantly revolves around two things, which is one going to be changing your body composition, which is going to occur over a longer period of time due to some kind of dieting. Um, And obviously with athletes, the way they diet is, it's extremely vast. You know, for example, Junior Dos Santos recently put something up showing that he was walking around at, um, what, 220 now or something, 210. So he's lost a fair bit of weight. It almost looks like he can make a run at light heavyweight. Um, But he said he was on the keto diet for that. And then there's other people who... So, for example, the the keto diet, and you know, I think um, the mighty Joe Hogan himself has probably contributed a bit to the the propagation ask, of that. Ask any MMA fan in the world what a keto diet is; they would turn into like a nutritionist in front of your eyes. They know yeah, all about which, it. Which, yeah, which is which is honestly kind of insane to me because if I was going to pick a sport where the ketogenic diet would be a bad idea for it, MMA would probably be one of the top sports I would pick because of basic chemistry that carbo- the anaerobic energy, the anaerobic energy systems that are used for high intensity exercise or, or, or in other words, punching people requires carbohydrates to function. You cannot put fats 
through glycolysis. They only go through the aerobic portions, which are the slower amounts. So we, we know we've seen, and it's possible if you're an ultra endurance athlete that the ketogenic diet might be a good idea performance wise, but speaking performance wise for MMA, it's, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But then again, if they lose a lot of weight and fight at a lower weight class, then if that's the way that they do it, that's the way they do it. But in any case, there's, there's some kind of body composition change that's occurring over time for whatever diet they're going to decide to use. And then there's usually some manipulation, some then more acute manipulations, which typically either occur with what food is in the gut. So for example, a lot of guys are doing, um, so, um, like occasionally I, I weigh myself quite, quite regularly, just keep an eye on my weight because I am far too willing to eat an entire pack of Oreos if it's there. So, you know, I, I, I track everything I eat and I weigh myself all the time because otherwise it's, it's going to slip. My wife also weighs herself a fair bit and we usually do it on the same day. And sometimes she's like, Oh, why, why am I, why am I heavier now? And she, she knows why she's just winching. <laughs> um, but it's essentially based on what we eat the previous day. And we know exactly, for example, if we've had garlic bread the day before, or we've had something that's really high fiber, then there's no point in weighing ourselves the next day because we're going to be really heavy. Or if we've had a really salty meal. And so these are usually things about one, you're trying to manipulate what's in the gut, which is having say no fiber for a few days out from the weigh-in. And then there's some kind of manipulation of body water. And what I typically have specialized and focused on is are those manipulations of body water. And you can do that in a lot of ways. You could sit in a sauna, you could sit in a hot bath, you could wrap yourself up in towels, you could run, you could do increasingly aggressive Zumba until you sweat everything out. You can, if you're moving that fluid, and I'm not entirely sure that there's going to be much difference between the methods of losing fluid, except for if they're active or if they're passive. If you're losing fluid via, say, going for runs in a sweatsuit, then you're inducing that actively and you're going to obviously be burning a lot more glycogen and everything in those periods compared to passive. But I'm not actually, and we need data on this because, again, this, this really is closer to, this is me making an educated guess, but it is still a guess that I'm not entirely convinced that there would be much difference between losing 3% of your body weight in a sauna versus 3% of your body weight in a hot bath. From a physiological perspective, passive heat exposure is more or less passive heat exposure. Um, yeah. So, and so, so when they're dropping all this weight, um, we mentioned, you know, 9%, 11%, whatever it is. With the, with the energy deficiency, with the dehydration, um, where is that weight coming from? Like as far as the, the proportion of it, is it um, water, fat, muscle? Like where so is that coming from? In, in terms of body composition, I guess to answer it in kind of a, a, a three-part, so the body composition is mainly going to be coming from fat mass or muscle mass. And this is a thing when fighters when you're not eating enough um so when the amount of food they're eating is low enough and their training volume is high enough chances are their bodies are going to start metabolizing some of that muscle tissue but probably the majority of that is coming from from adipose tissue or fat in terms of um when i said about gut manipulation obviously that's just through their passing and making sure that there's less sitting in the gut at any point but the main thing with water is that where we lose water from entirely depends on how much water we actually lose. So there seems to be a point which is about four ish percent dehydration, maybe about three ish. It depends what source you get, where the body starts pulling fluid from inside the cells. Now, most of the time, you're, you're pretty much storing. Fluid is kind of everywhere in your body. You know, your body's somewhere between 60 and 75, 75-ish percent water. So it, it, it does depend. And like a lot of that is going to come from your plasma. Um, so they're just the, your blood. But then a good portion of that is also going to come from the cells around your body. And a lot of that is from the muscle tissue. So there's not a lot of water stored in, in fat cells. 
Um, so it's it's um, off the top of my head that it's about 10% of the adipose cells weight is actually water. But in terms of a muscle fiber, it's about 75%. So a lot of muscle fibers weight is in the form of water. Um, now your cells are also floating around in fluid or this interstitial fluid. And when you do little amounts of dehydration, small amounts to say 2% and under, your body's mainly taking it from the blood and from that interstitial fluid. So just the fluid around your cells. Once you start to hit that three to 4% and over, that's when it starts pulling it from inside the cells as well. And that seems to be where the biggest effect on performance is. If you, if you dehydrate a little bit, I'm fairly confident that someone could dehydrate 2%. And then a few hours later, if, they, if they've lost that weight without inducing a lot of fatigue, say by running, but if they've done that passively, and then if they rehydrate straight away, they could probably perform three hours later and be pretty fine. The drop seems to be once you start pulling fluid out of the inside, so from inside the cells. And that seems to be associated with those larger weight cuts. Because this is the thing that water in your body isn't all equal. So if I dehydrate 5% of my body mass right now, or say I dehydrate, uh, how much this water bottle is 600 mils say I, so i dehydrate 600 grams then i scull this water bottle boom problem solved no not not at all because that water's sitting in my stomach not in my cells where it came from and not right so you have to get it back where it came from and the body with little bits of dehydration is very efficient at resolving that quickly but when the dehydration gets larger the body gets less and less efficient at doing it um, because you, your, your fluid is essentially balanced by, you know, concentrations of electrolytes with and without the cell and osmotic pressure and the larger portions of weight of the weight cut or larger portions of dehydration, the body seems to just, it, because it doesn't pull that out straight away, it wants to keep it. It has a hard time getting it out, but it also has a pretty hard time putting it back. And that seems to be. That was the thing when we had people in that study, which 24 hours later, their repeat effort performance was lower. They'd pretty much, even though there was a statistically significant difference in body mass, hold on, let me just make sure. There we go. I just realized I was still in my email and it started pinging yeah. a lot, which obviously can be pretty annoying. Um, but when we looked at those people in the 24 hours, right? I'll, I'll actually read the number off at you so you can get a gist of what I'm talking about. Um, where Where is it? There it is. So before everything, the average body mass was 76.6 kilos. And then afterwards, so 24 hours later, we're looking at um, 76.1. So the difference is only 500 grams at that point. It's 500 milliliters. It's not a lot, but... We saw some difference in markers of hydration, but then some not. The markers of hydration is a whole other conversation. But the the difference in weight isn't massive, but there was still a, a pretty significant performance effect remaining. And we don't know exactly why that is, but and I suspect it's because of a lot of things, but one of the possible explanations there really is that even though they've put fluid back into the body, it's not necessarily in the places it came from and the, the negative effects of pulling it out. So you're not just pulling fluid out. You're pulling out a lot of electrolytes. You're also using a lot of energy to pull that around. And all of that process obviously isn't recovering within 24 hours. And so you just mentioned the plasma and that's the most interesting thing that I, that I read. Um, can you expand a little bit more on that? So when they're cutting um, a lot of water weight, they're also losing plasma from their blood? Yeah, so the, the body will essentially take fluid from anywhere it can get it, but your your blood is, depending on how hydrated you are and your training status and sex and all that, but around 55-ish percent plasma, which plasma is essentially just water um, for the most part. And that that water can obviously get pulled out and then go through the sweat glands and that can then get 
sweat out. So that's obviously going to reduce your blood volume, which can reduce your cardiac output. But whilst that might be one of the first places that the body draws fluid from, it's also probably one of the first places that it puts it back because that's what's happening in your small intestine where you're getting the, when you're ingesting water, that it's then going into the bloodstream. So that's replenishing the plasma. It then has to go around the body and get to the the cells, you know, cells in my skin here, muscle cells in my quads, wherever. And it has to then travel there, leave the plasma and be deposited in that area and then kind of go around. The way water is balanced, the, the way I've kind of tried to, the way I, the way I look at it is, the balance of water in your body is really delicate and it's really intricate and your body is constantly making little finite changes to maintain your, your water, your water balance within your body. So, you know, if I go, if I drank an entire bottle of water within 30 minutes, I'd be in the bathroom peeing pretty clear and getting all that out. But then when you weight cut, you're taking this really delicate balance and just ripping things out of it forcefully because the body doesn't want to be dehydrated. It's doing it to stop you from dying of overheating. Um, And you're basically taking that really delicate process and just throwing it entirely out of whack. And we really don't know a lot about how the body actually recovers from that in terms of a performance and how long it takes. We know how long someone, I could lose for I could lose three kilos of water and then just skull three liters of water. And on the scales, I would look the same. And in that moment, there might be the same total amount of water in my body. But we even have, we even know that if I did that, chances are my body wouldn't actually put most of that in the cells again. It'd probably pee it out. Because when you start, because when you start, um, so, so your, your, your body actually has no way of counting, for, for want of a better word, all of the water molecules inside your body. The way it filters fluid is through your kidneys and looking at the concentration of electrolytes. So if you lose a lot of water, you also lose a lot of electrolytes, but usually you lose more water than electrolytes. So your electrolyte concentration goes up and you start peeing less. But then if I go, oh, I'm dehydrated and I scull a bunch of pure water with little to no electrolytes in it, then I'm increasing the amount of water and decreasing the concentration of electrolytes. And then you start peeing more. So if I lose a kilo of sweat, which is a a liter, then I drink a liter of pure water. Some percentage of that water, because my blood is so diluted, uh, is going to actually just get peed straight back out. So this is why when you look at like the ACSM guidelines and various other guidelines about rehydration, they actually recommend that you drink more water than you lost purely because of that effect. But that's just for regular exercise. When you're doing something as extreme as weight cutting, it's, it's worse. And the rehydration protocol is complicated as well, which a lot of people probably aren't considering when they're going through this. And so... One of the the bad effects of it too is like aside from the plasma and where the blood is is being uh, drawn out of, um, is also the brain fluid too. Oh yeah, yeah. So your your brain is brain and spinal cord are just fl- floating around in cerebral spinal fluid, which is water mixed with other things. So yeah, you can pull it out of um, the central nervous system, and there is some evidence to suggest that when someone dehydrates, their brain morphology actually changes. Um, and that's been an area of interest. That's been an area of research that I'm, I'm really fascinated in. And I hope within the next few years, we can actually start looking at it. Because the thought is that your brain is floating around in your skull, right? And it's got this thick fluid around it. And one of the things that when Francis Ngannou punches you, your brain rattles around in your head, rattles around in your skull and bashes off the walls and that damages the brain tissue and that makes you do what Rosenstroke did and take an involuntary nap for a few minutes. And when you change the brain morphology, firstly, that cerebral spinal fluid 
changes in integrity. And we don't know, or I'm not aware necessarily of exactly how that changes because it's hard to look at. It's, you know, it's difficult to look at people's brains, even with things like fMRIs, it's, there's still limitations, but it's very reasonable that that would affect, first of all, how it rattles around. And secondly, when the brain is smaller, there's more, because it's essentially shriveling up at least somewhat, then it's rattling around in the skull even worse. Now, for clarity, this is pretty much all, a lot of it is speculation based off data in these areas. So there is data to suggest that it affects brain morphology and we know how concussions work, but there isn't really a study I'm aware of that shows how the brain moves differently when someone's dehydrated. Because when you think of it logistically, how do you really do that study? Like, how do I get that past ethics? Okay, ethics board, I'm going to get these guys and dehydrate them. And then I'm going to punch them in the head a bunch of times and see what happens to their brain. We're going to scan it. It's a hard sell. So Especially if Ngannou is things- recruited, they're not going to approve of it, you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, this is an open recruitment to Francis Ngannou to come be an astronaut. <laughs> I'll let him do it to me. No, I absolutely won't. Um, but it's this is one of the things in science where we have to be creative and we need to think about ways around this problem so that we can actually look at this. But I think it might be, especially in a sport like MMA or boxing or kickboxing or any of these combat sports where people are taking a lot of hits to the head. If that is a, if that is something, then that's an even bigger problem. And we wonder then whether I wonder then, I don't know how many other people are wondering, probably a lot, but how that affects athletes longevity. Um, because how long is your career going to be if your brain's constantly in a compromised state and getting hit? I can't imagine it's helpful. No, especially if it's coupled with, with acute dehydration mm. every couple of months on end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so we talked a little bit about um, different types of, w- of weight cutting and different methods of losing weight and the fact that a lot of them do impact performance. But let's talk a little bit about the mechanisms by which they actually affect performance. So let's say someone is uh, losing weight for a fight just by cutting um, certain food groups out, let's say carbohydrates and all that, which is like the commonly used method. Mm. How would that impact their physiology and and subsequently their performance? So there's kind of two areas to look at here, which is again, the chronic versus the acute. And my specialty is far more into the acute areas. And that's probably where I'd spend most of my time answering that question. But just to briefly talk about the the uh, chronic, because I'm not I'm not a diet specialist. Obviously, it's um, parallel to my area, but it's not say my my exact field of expertise. But we do know that, for example, if someone's in very low energy balance, especially if they're restricting carbohydrates, that their muscle glycogen is going to drop. And muscle glycogen has a massive effect on time to exhaustion and um, power output over certain periods of time, especially moderate duration. So your glycogen is probably not going to affect your ability to do something maximally for 10 seconds. But if you're doing something intensely for 10 minutes, then yes, your glycogen definitely could affect it. Um, So those kind of restrictive diets definitely could affect performance and the thing is if you're doing a, a, if your diet's really restrictive it is unlikely that you could undo that damage or 100 percent rectify that within the 24 hours between the weigh-in and your fight um the other thing obviously being that your body ad- adaptation is growth so if you're training your body obviously if you're in a negative energy balance you're not going to get as good gains during your training than you will in a positive energy balance. And that's probably a lot of the thing. And one of the curiosities about if people cut less weight, if they weren't doing that constant diet to dietary restriction during their training, chances are they'd be able to endure their training load a lot better and they might get better adaptations too. So that's mainly in the area of, of, of the chronic, but when we talk about the acute, 
that's when things get wonky. <laughs> um, because we understand fairly well how diet affects, how chronic diets can affect performance in, in those areas. The acute area is really where it gets weird. So when I did my master's degree, which was where we published one of my first studies, the one of the ones I keep referencing about performance, um, at the end of that study, so I initially I didn't, what I, my plan wasn't going to academia. It was just I wanted to know the answer to this question, so I'll do a master's degree. And then I was like, yeah, at the end of this master's degree, I'm going to know everything there is to know about weight cutting and problem will be solved. Cool, good. Then I got to the end of my master's and I was like, okay, so it affects perform, it affects physical performance, but why? And then it's like, well, guess I'll do a PhD. <laughs> and we spent a lot of time designing this study that was spicy study design. So Nobel Prize, we, I heard. It was, not, it was nominated for the Nobel Prize, I heard. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, got, yeah. I got four. I also got the Peace <laughs> Prize as well for it. <laughs> um, but this, this study, we had methods in like uh, advanced nerve stimulation. So, for example, we would stimulate the femoral nerve when people are doing maximal contractions to let us work out central versus peripheral fatigue. So is someone's fatigue occurring within their central nervous system or is it occurring in the muscle tissue itself? Um, we had all these advanced methods using muscle stimulation, nerve stimulation, um, EMG, and we found nothing. We found absolutely nothing. It was you wasted it was, four years. <laughs> well, that was just one of the three studies that I did in my PhD. Um, but it was the one I was probably most excited for. And nil results are still results. Um, but we found that performance was worse. So the performance was worse. They, their strength endurance was worse, but there, there was no evidence of central fatigue or no evidence of peripheral fatigue. So then I'm looking at it going, excuse me, what, <laughs> what are these? I remember when I'd, I'd analyzed the results, I'm just looking at them going, what? I was a hundred percent sure that this was going to show something. And again, it's one of the reasons why, you know, it speaks to the integrity of science as well when, when I'm publishing data that, that, that I hate, <laughs> that I'm going, no, this isn't doing what I want it to do, but <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the results. So I, I published the results. But one thing we did find was that Eve, now there probably wasn't, obviously we didn't assess absolutely every mechanism in that study. And that's something I have to, it's, it's, I don't even know if it's possible to assess every single mechanism, but it didn't look like it would have been an effect of cardiac output. So the blood volume probably wouldn't be less. We only did this one, a uh, weight cut, and then three hours later. But the hematocrit, um, three hours post, and the percentage of their blood that was red blood cells, which gives us some indication of their um, the, the amount of plasma that they'd, they'd lost. The body mass, three hours later, was essentially the same. The methods of blood hydration we had the hematocrit were essentially the same it didn't look like it would have been an output of cardiac output so it wouldn't look like it's from say the heart not being up able to output enough it probably possibly we didn't assess muscle glycogen concentration so it possibly could have been that but you would expect that to show up in the peripheral measures um but basically everything was kind of nil except for um, our measures of um, our profile of mood states data, so our psychological data. And what we found was that three hours later, so in this, by the way, in this study, just for um, rigor purposes, we did the weight cut and then we just assessed this three hours later because we really wanted to just see what, it, it, obviously there's a lot of extra logistics to do in 24 hours and we were trying to do this as a proof of concept initially because if it doesn't, if it doesn't affect these things at three hours, it's not going to suddenly affect them at 24. Um, but we found that fatigue, their perception of fatigue was much higher when they'd done the weight cut. So they perceive themselves as being more tired. So that, and then if I look at the previous study, I then look at the rating of perceived exertion. So how hard they perceived the work to be. And during the physical test, that was then higher 
in the weight cutting group. So now what we've got is no evidence of any of these straight physiological, conventional physiological markers, but we do have differences in psychological perception. And that leads me to believe that there's at least a decent possibility that this could be mental fatigue. And kind of it's all in your head, but it's not really all in your head. The, the concept of mental fatigue is a, a bit of a weird one, and I'm certainly not the best expert on it. Um, but it is a mix of uh, physiological things within the brain, but also um, so there is physiology and then there's also straight psychology in it. But it does seem that people just felt worse in general even though there might not have been strictly anything going on within their body at that point, they weren't able to shake that feeling and that then makes them feel tighter. And, you know, we've all experienced this in, in some way or another, even if it's not to do with weight cutting. So since all the gyms closed, for example, I've started running a lot. I do and, too. I hate it. Yeah, it, it sucks. Seriously, guys, running is the one. <laughs> it's so bad. Work. Uh, get, get rid of that. Um, but I've been consistently watching my pace and I ran yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. Yes. One of the runs I had yesterday, I was running and I didn't feel good. And I looked at the end of it and my heart rate wasn't as high as it usually was. My pace was a little bit slower than it usually was. There was no real reason for that. I just didn't feel good. And thus I couldn't push myself as hard. And when you start to feel fatigued, your output is obviously going to drop and a lot of things are going to change. And that seems to be potentially, at least in some, some parts, contributing to how these acute weight losses affect performance. Now, another thing to remember though, is now we blend that into the chronic. And if someone's been on a really t harsh diet for two months, they're probably not full of energy. And my question then becomes, do these things blend together? And do we have people feeling more fatigued from all the dieting that they're doing, the extreme dieting that these athletes are using? They're probably a bit, they're probably overtrained. And then we combine it with the psychological fatigue from the weight cut. And we're actually probably getting quite a lot of mental strain on these athletes going into these matches. And there's a lot of questions about how that might affect performance and how, and it's not as simple as just going, okay, it's all in your head. Just don't believe it's there and it's gone because it's more about it creates, it's not, you consciously going, yeah, I feel tired because of that. It's just a more general feeling of, of crappiness. And that seems to affect the performance pretty big. And even if it's but only we, in your head, then that's, that's enough to just throw you off completely. And, you know, yeah, well, at the end of the day, it doesn't ultimately matter too much why it's doing what it's doing. It's just that it is doing what it's doing. But one of the reasons we want to know why is if we can know why, we can start to work out ways to potentially mitigate it. Um, so, for example, if we knew, oh, hey, this is peripheral and not central, and then we do the electrolyte balance, and, yep, that's electrolytes. It's probably due to poor electrolytes. We could try different, say, electrolyte supplementation protocols and everything to try and recover from weight cutting better. But, unfortunately, I don't see an approach to really solve the problem of mental fatigue in, in athletes induced by this. It's not like there's a supplement that we can give someone unless you're giving them cocaine. Maybe that would overpower it. But again, you know, John Jones tried that and it's probably it not the ideal oh. strategy. No, not, not from a USADA perspective, but no yeah. crash into a pole actually, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get to managing weight cuts or sorry, like post weight cut rehydration uh, in a yep. sec, or at least like ways to mitigate weight cut. But I want to touch on uh, diuretics or, you know, specifically um, prescription drugs. So Chris Cyborg tested positive 
over two years ago for spironolactone, which is like a, a prescription uh, drug taken usually for high blood pressure and stuff like that because it's right. considered a water pill. Um, have you done a lot of work uh, in, in MMA fighters' use of diuretics? Um, not directly. So, for example, in the study we did about the different methods of weight cutting and what people report using, I'm just pulling the table up now so I have a point of reference. Um, the, the use of diuretics didn't seem to be as prevalent as some of the other methods. So, for example, in MMA we saw um, 7% of athletes saying they regularly use diuretics for their weight cut. Um, the highest number we got there was in both Taekwondo and wrestling, which was 12%. So these don't seem to be extremely prevalent methods, but they still definitely get used. Um, and a diuretic is obviously a pretty effective way to shed water weight, but I don't think the difference there probably wouldn't be massive to any other kind of water loss i would i wouldn't expect um especially if they're combining it with sweating anyway because really the water is getting lost from the body and then ultimately getting drawn from other places so yeah and it's hard it's very hard to do studies in that area as well one because once you st once you start giving people medication basically abusing medication in a study it's obviously hard to get ethical approval there but also it's difficult now especially at the highest level within the ufc that that's not allowed anymore so we're testing something that on paper no one should actually be doing though i expect some people still are maybe cyborg will, will sign up yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, diuretics, diuretics are a weird one. And I don't, if I understand correctly, and I'm not, I don't work for USADA. So USADA, if, you, if you're looking behind me, then uh, hit me. Hit, hit then Jeff Nabisky listens to this podcast all the time. <laughs> nice. Um, but I, I don't believe USADA actually have diuretics banned because of their, their effect on weight cutting. I think they're banned because they're used as a masking agent for um, urine tests. So if you're taking some some steroid that shows up in the urine, if you take diuretics, it dilutes your urine far more, so you're less likely to, to test positive. In terms of the weight cutting, it, on, honestly, I don't see that much of an ethical difference between using diuretics and using a sauna. Both are forcing your body to lose water mass in an unethical way to try and gain a competitive advantage over your opponents. So, but I'm not, I'm not aware of data looking at them in performances specifically, but I, I would expect it would be very similar to the other methods that have been used. Right. And so, so I guess that's similar to IVs, like IVs were banned when USADA came in because they're used as yeah. a masking agent, even though, yeah. you know, um, so let's say they weren't banned. Would that be a, a, like a decent um, I, way I'm to not rehydrate? I'm not convinced that IVs would be better than anything else. All I've really seen for that is anecdotes of people saying, yeah, I feel really good when I have an IV. But there are some studies that have been used in cycling that have shown no real positive effect of IVs on performance. And the thing is, especially when you've got 24 hours, your body has evolved for hundreds of thousands, millions of years to do one, to do a lot of things. But in this case, to get water from your stomach to your cells in the correct balance. And when you're using an IV and you're just shoving it all into the blood, there's no guarantee that your body's actually going to, that you're actually going to be effectively rehydrating. Um, it might get it in there slightly faster than if you were drinking it. But to be honest, I'm not sure that that is the biggest problem. Again, it comes down to the question of if I just scull two liters of water and I've lost two kilos, I'll be the same on the scales. Are my problems resolved? Not really. 
And it's about where that water's going. And I'm not convinced that using an IV would do it any better than, than water. In fact, I would expect that you would get better benefits from, say, using glucose electrolyte solutions, um, like Powerade, Gatorade, and stuff like that. You would probably get better success with that um, and just doing a really rigorous rehydration protocol where you're actually planning when you're going to be taking things in and you're actually making sure that you're doing it on time and that even if at this point, oh, I'm not as thirsty anymore because my stomach's kind of full, if you've got the time and you're not close to competition, you're still working through that to maximize your rehydration. I, I would be inclined to think that would actually be more effective than an IV. Um, I think it almost definitely, and again, the data on this is still kind of sketchy, so I'm, I'm making educated guesses here, but I would say that the IV is probably more of a placebo effect than it is, if there is an effect, I would say it's probably more of a placebo than it is an actual basis in physiology. So it's not really that big of a loss, I guess, uh, that they banned it. No, I don't, I, mean, I, like I, I don't think so. Yeah. No, I, 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 don't, I don't think so at all. I like To be honest, um, it's probably a net gain because um, obviously you've got some... To, to, to actually administer an IV properly, you need you know a trained medical doctor and a lot of people who were doing some real sketchy IVs and probably risking their own health and well-being. And, and you know, people neglect how dangerous incorrect water consumption can be. I could drink so much water that I, that I die because my heart fails because I dilute my electrolytes so much and my nervous system shuts down. There's, and the thing is you could do that quicker using an IV and forcing it past your guts than if you're letting your digestive system at least try to protect you somewhat. So it's, I don't, I don't see it as any loss to be honest. Wow. That's yeah. I never considered that at all. Um, so one FC, which is like a promotion similar to the UFC, um, mm. they introduced like hydration tests during fight week to make sure that fighters are not like overly dehydrating themselves. So let's say you check in for the fight on Monday or Tuesday of fight week. Um, you do a hydration test then. And then mm. on mon- now on Wednesday, you do it again. And then on Friday and so on and so forth. So... They make sure that fighters are not overly dehydrated. Now, something you did mention in one of your studies is that we don't actually have like a reliable and a valid way to like truly measure hydration to begin with. Mm. So could you expand a little bit more on that? Yeah. So we're actually in the pretty late stages of publishing a review paper in this area that I'm hoping will be open access as well. So um, everyone will be able to read it. But essentially, we've done a, a full review of the methods of hydration hydration testing available. And basically, one of the things you and anyone listening might have picked up by now is that where the body stores water and how the body stores water is complicated. And hydration is very complicated. And I, I like 1FC. I've been to one of 1FC's one, one of, uh, shows. And in terms of their showmanship, I actually probably preferred their approach to the UFC in, in some takes. Like, you know, when they have people coming out to fights with, you know, full lasers and, and music and everything and Stamp Fairtex came out to her fight that I saw live and you're dancing and everything. I was like, this, this kind of showmanship is great. Um, and I like that they care about weight cutting and that they're trying to do something. But unfortunately, I think, especially in terms of their hydration testing, they've probably taken something that seems good on paper, but really isn't going to achieve what they want it to achieve. So if we take the test that they're using, for example, which is urine specific gravity, we've published data in now three different studies showing that hydration tests will consistently give wildly different results at the exact same time point. So, you know, in this study, typically you consider serum osmolality or plasma osmolality to be as close to a gold standard for assessing hydration as possible. Um, I absolutely wouldn't call it a gold standard. I, I, it still has several problems, but it's probably one of the better ones. And in this study... What is that one? What is that approach? Serum osmolality is taking a bit of blood, 
whacking in a centrifuge, spinning it down, and then getting the plasma or serum, depending on what tube you okay. use, and pipetting a bit of it, and then assessing the basically the concentration of particles in that or the osmolality. And if that, if you're more, if you're better hydrated, then the osmolality will be lower. If you're dehydrated, there'll be more particles for any given amount of liquid. So it shows that you're more dehydrated. Um, but at this point, osmolality was saying, no, there's no difference between the groups. They're the exact same. The hematocrit, which is the percentage of the blood that are red blood cells, that was the same. But then the urine specific gravity was saying they were dehydrated. So in this case, every marker of dehydration was essentially saying, no, nah, that they're not significantly dehydrate, dehydrated at this point, but urine specific gravity was. And we need to think a bit about how this works within the body. So the functional fluid in my body is not in my bladder. And urine is assessing, the, so urinary, so urine specific gravity is assessing urine, so fluid in the bladder. Now that's not being used. And essentially the most important fluid that we're thinking about for athletes' well-being, and in many cases their performance, is the fluid in the cells. And the fluid in the cells is filtered into the interstitial fluid flowing around it. And that's filtered into the bloodstream. And that's then filtered into the urine. So when we test the urine, we're like four levels removed from what we actually want to look at. And even when we test the blood, we're not looking directly at what we're trying to look at. And the thing is, the body will, when you haven't, so I haven't drunk water for a while. Um, I had my lunch and I haven't had anything since then. My urine specific gravity is probably going to start going up, but my plasma and my cells are fine. My body's just retaining more fluid because I'm not taking in more fluid. Now, is that going, would I perform worse now than an hour and a half ago when I had my last drink, even though my urine specific gravity would probably be a bit higher? No. And is my body actually more dehydrated? Not really, not in any functional sense. So, and the thing is, this is so heavily affected on what we drink. So, for example, you could try and trick a urine specific gravity test pretty easy. If you dehydrated slightly more than you needed to lose, and then you just drank some distilled water because it's so pure, as I talked about before, you're diluting the blood a bit and your kidneys are going to start filtering it out even more. So then it will dilute your urine a bit and then you can just pee and pass the test even though you're really dehydrated. Oh. In fact, I mentioned that and I know for a fact, I can't mention names, but I'm aware of a few people in 1FC who do that. And that, you know, the, the urine test is convenient but unfortunately, it's probably not valid. It wasn't designed for this function. It wasn't designed for someone who's aggressively dehydrating a lot of weight and then aggressively planning to put weight back on. It's, it was designed for clinical settings, people who weren't trying to trick it, people who weren't doing insane fluctuations in their body water artificially. And the same goes for all of these tests. Even if we consider serum osmolality, that what is considered the gold standard. Again, the blood is not exactly where most of this is happening. And if I myself, if I was really dehydrated and then I put back it, I drank some water, that water would go into my blood first. So you might do that test and go, oh yeah, the blood says he's fine. But actually none of it's back in my cells yet. And maybe I've just peed most of it out. And I haven't effectively, it's not back in my brain yet. So maybe my brain tissue, my, so my brain tissue is still smaller. My cerebrospinal fluid has changed and all these dangers and all these risks still exist, but we've now given a false check or yep, they're all good because we did this test, which doesn't actually measure exactly what we want it to measure. But so un unless you're using the water in your piss to fuel you during a fight, this, this whole test is useless it's well I, I i don't know whether i would use a word as strong as useless honestly i'm inclined to but i'm i'm restraining myself <laughs> um it's use is limited it's because you're you're sponsored um, by one fc yeah, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> i'm sponsored by the guys who make <laughs> use gravity tests they own my house no um unfortunately i think their use is limited and that's not to say that we shouldn't be doing them at all. But my concern is we have direct data 
showing that urine specific gravity probably gives false positives. And we've published that. But now we're going to base athletes' careers on that. So someone's, their livelihood is being able to fight. And imagine if they turn up and they're actually fine. So if you assess their serum, if you assess their hematocrit, if you did urine osmolality as well, if you did their body mass, if you did all these other things, it would say they're fine. But we're relying on this urine specific gravity. And if that says they're dehydrated and they turn around and go, okay, you can't fight. We've now significantly affected these people's income and their ability to make a living based on the fact that we just wanted to use something that was convenient, but probably not valid. And the problem there is if you ma- if we make mistakes here, because I, I want weight cutting to not be a problem in combat sports anymore. You, I'm sure everyone can tell at this point from the way I talk at the start, I love combat sports. It's why I do what I do. That's the whole reason I'm here. But I don't want to make a mistake. And if we implement a, if we implement a policy that has a lot of negative outcomes for these athletes, then they're going to resist anything we do in the future. And when we ultimately potentially do have a good decision, they'll go, oh, no, remember this time you implemented that test that turned out to be useless and cost us all a lot of money. And we get more resistance further down the line. I would rather, and maybe my philosophy here is different to someone else. And I have had arguments with other people in my field about this. So I know this isn't the exact thinking of every scientist in this area. but. I would rather do nothing than rush and do something that we don't know is actually correct. Um, and, I, and I think that's the difference between you who is in your position looking at things from um, like an outside perspective, more of like a scientific perspective, and then someone running a professional organization because to them it's, hey, if we run those hydration tests, then this is great PR for our company. Yeah. Like, you know, if, if, if MMA news outlets put it out there, hey, 1FC is doing this, now all eyes are going to be drawn to 1FC and they're going to get, you know, an increase in, in viewership and so on and so forth. So, yeah. And I, um, so for example, I uh, r- browse the MMA subreddit fairly Same. frequently. Shout, shout out to the subreddit r uh, slash MMA. Um, but, if I see someone in the comment sections again, just saying the statement one FC cured weight cutting, I'm really, I'm going to pull my hair out. <laughs> I see it far too often. And I, I, I applaud one FC for trying to do something. And I can see why they have picked the approach that they have. And some of the things they've done, I'm sure are, are fine. And I, it's been a while since I've actually read over their policy, but I remember reading over most of the policy and going, yeah, it's fine. That's, that's, that's probably a good move. But the hydration testing is one that I think is, is probably pretty problematic, um, which is yeah. tough. I'm, I'm actually working on another, another paper, um, which is actually talking about, how do we actually approach the topic of weight cutting? And the, the paper's a mess <laughs> because initially I was like, yeah, this is going to be a good paper to write. And then we, we started writing it and I'm working on it with a few other authors. And it's just reached this point where I'm like, this topic is hard <laughs> because unfortunately I don't have clear answers, but that is the nature of reality. And I'm not, it's not my job. And as a scientist, in fact, the opposite is my job that I I'm not here to propose answers when I don't have them and when I don't have good evidence for it. And, you know, I can make educated guesses at times, but I always have to preface those as educated guesses. And in the case of this, how to solve weight cutting, I don't know if you made me emperor of MMA. So I'm just the emperor of MMA. I'm above daddy Dana here. And who would be like the admin of, of the MMA subreddit. I think that's the, yeah. The king that's of who's in charge. Yeah. The mods. Um, but I don't know what I would do. If you said, Oliver, you've got absolute control now solve weight cutting. I honestly don't know what I would do. And I don't know if I would do anything different because I would be, I would want good evidence that something is going to work before we try it. 
And even things that might seem really smart, like here's what we're going to do. We're going to weigh you two weeks before the fight and make sure that you're only within this, um, you're, you're only within this percent of your fight weight or else we're not going to let you fight. And someone proposed that to me. And I don't know whether this is my overly literal brain, but as soon as they, it was suggested to me, I went, what stops them from cutting weight for the other way in? Yeah, exactly. And it, I didn't get a good response. Um, unless you're going to do it USADA style and randomly test and turn up and be like, get on these scales. But then you run into a problem of what if some guys just hit up Outback Jacks and eat and, you know, massive steak and some chips and stuff. And then you you're mean like, Johnny hey, Hendrix. You could just use the name Johnny yeah. Hendrix. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> what if they turn up to Johnny Hendrix just in the at a point where he's going, oh, I've just eaten all this steak, and then he hops on and he's really heavy, and they go, oh, can't fight. Well, actually, it was just a bunch of stuff sitting in his gut. So we need to, when we're trying to do something, because this 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 field of MMA, this or, or combat sports already exists, and weight cutting already exists, and it's already happening. And yes, people have died from weight cutting, and it. It's, it's tragic and it's not good. But for the most part, people aren't dying from weight cutting. When, when someone dies from weight cutting, that's a news story. When someone dies from crashing a car, that's just everyday life. And that's not to play down the effects of weight cutting because there's a big scale between someone died and everything's hunky-dory. You know, people are probably inducing a lot of damage in their body through all of this. There's probably long-term ramifications. but I'm hesitant to start jumping in and forcing solutions that I don't know are going to work. So I might create more problems than I solve. If, you know, with that, as I said, with that backup weighing, maybe I've just doubled the amount of weight cutting. You know, maybe, you know, there's ones like people saying, oh, well, let's make it so there's a shorter period of time between the weighing and the competition. Let's make them weigh in just at the side of the cage. Then the question becomes, well, then if someone cuts weight for that, they're almost definitely going to be at a high risk of brain damage because then they're going to go probably be going in there actively dehydrated. Maybe people recover less. If we make it three hours, people recover less and then are more likely to get injured. There are, we need to think about the butterfly effect here. And I obviously have a very conservative view when I do this, which is I don't want to do anything until I've got a high degree of confidence. And, and the product, I think, in the octagon would suck if, if the weigh-ins were like right before competition because you see how yeah. those fighters on Friday morning, how they w- walk out from the scale. Like they got their co- they're leaning on their coaches to walk yeah. back to the, to, the, to the table where there's water. Like you want that yep. guy to go fight, then the, the fight's going to suck yep. if, if it happens exactly. at all, if they even yeah. allow them to. Um, what about introducing more like weight divisions? So instead of going uh, 145, 155, 170, 185, and then all the way to 205. What about like introducing more and more weight classes? What, what, um, what would your thoughts be on that? I'm not opposed to it. Um, I don't, I, I rack my brain and I can't think of a negative. Um, I don't know whether it would solve the problem or not. Um, or or uh, it, it definitely wouldn't solve the problem, but I don't know if it would minimize the problem or not. It does seem very problematic that, Middleweight is 83.9 kilos or something, and light heavyweight is 93. That we have a nine kilo, which is massive, jump between two weight classes that are right next to each other. That does seem problem- problematic. And in terms of, I would probably, if I was, if you made me king of UFC this, this, or king of MMA, this might be one of the only things I would do, which would probably have. 55 kilo weight class, which, which would be like flyweight. And then I just have a weight class every five kilos, pretty much. Um, so, so the margins would be... 10 pounds or so? Yeah, maybe 10 pounds or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and just go straight that way. And then there'd, there'd be more weight classes, definitely. But there'd be more chances for the tweeners to actually be able to find a class that was comfortable for them um, and be less likely to try and cut a massive amount of weight. So, well, I can think of a negative for that, but it's not, it's not related to like physiology and cutting weight, but it's more so, I think if you add more weight classes, it's just going to water down the quality of, of each division. Like you look at the, possibly the, you look at the lightweight. Now it's the best division in the UFC and it's amazing talent. It's stacked. 
um, you introduce a 65 pound division and I don't know how many of them are going to stick around. Yeah, it's true. Um, and I, and I don't know. I think if you get better performances because people are cutting less weight and the athletes are more happy, maybe we'd have more stars in each class. Um, you know, you will definitely have more example, championship fights. So, so for example, if there was an atom weight division, Michelle Waterson might be far more, she's already popular, but she might be a superstar at this point, but because she's having to fight people far bigger than her, obviously she's, she's losing some fights. She's having some, she's having some good fights, but it, it's definitely struggling to build that division. But if the atom weight was there, we've got someone who now is, is, is popular but could be a superstar if we have them in a, a, a place where they can actually thrive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've taken enough of your time, but I, I want to end on this and um, kind of one final question. I know you said you don't have an answer and I don't think anybody has an answer um, to solve weight cutting in MMA, but do you ever foresee a future where weight divisions or, you know, at least weight cutting is just not a thing in combat sports anymore? No. No. And no, I I don't. I I don't see one way it's not a thing anymore. And that's not even my goal at this point. My goal at this point is to just try and minimize it because I, I don't really have an, 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 a problem to if someone goes, Oh, Hey, I weigh in at world of weight. So I'm 77 kilos. Slightly above that. I'm walking around at 77.5. I'm going to sweat out 500 grams. I don't have a problem with that because not everybody's going to organically fit exactly at the weight classes that we assign. The problem is when people abuse it, and if we can have nobody ever cutting more than 2% of their body mass within 24 hours of the fight, I think fighter safety, fighter performance, and everything is going to improve. And there probably is always going to have to be a little bit of cutting. For if, say, we have a 75 kilo division, an 80 kilo division, and there's someone who just walks around at 78, you know, they're going to lose a bit of weight, but they might not exactly be on that 75. And Maybe they've got to do a little bit of dehydration to just cut it out. And I think that's, that's fine. Um, and a lot of this probably comes down to, to, to uh, coach and athlete education and letting them know about, you know, how these things can affect their performance and some strategies that might help them um, get more out of it, I guess, and, and perform better than, because the problem is we can't force this. We can't go, Hey guys, we've passed this rule. Weight cutting is no longer allowed. I right, here's how we're going to try and now force it on everybody because people are crafty, and I don't see a realistic way to implement that. You know, oh, let's do hydration testing. Well, there's all these problems with hydration testing, and we're probably going to cause more problems than we solve. So a lot of this is probably going to have to come from changes within the community, and that is one thing I have noticed is that there there are. For example, I've delivered speeches and, and or, or presentations, I should say, speech is a bit of a weird word, but I've delivered presentations to um, people within the field and I have found that at one presentation I had a few of the old school coaches going, oh, nah, this, we know how to cut weight properly, you know, don't worry about it. But then afterwards, a few of the younger coaches at some gyms came up to me and was like, oh, that was really good. Um, we definitely want to start cutting less weight and, so there does seem to be a shift and it does seem, unfortunately it does seem that a lot of the old school ingrained people in, in combat sports maybe aren't shifting as much, but you know, the, the younger people that are coming through and ultimately becoming coaches, they seem much more amenable to the kind of work that we're doing. And hopefully we can at least create enough of an environment that this becomes a standard now, because I, I, I just want, I just want the best fights and the happiest fighters and the safest fighters there. That's pretty much my goal in all of this is to have the best combat sports we can have. And I think that has to be, we have to all, we have to work together on that. We can't force it on people. And that's again, a reason why I'm hesitant to do things that I don't know aren't going to work because I, I want to keep that relationship good. I don't want people to hear 
oh yeah, did you hear um, Oliver Barley was on a podcast and they go, oh, that guy, that guy just wants to control everything we do and he just, he just, he doesn't know anything. He's an idiot. I, I, I don't, I don't want that. I want this to be a good relationship and that's why I'm, you know, I'm trying to approach this the way I am, I guess. You kind of sounded like Keith Peterson there because allegedly he was boozing and, and just smoking cigarettes before the fight. That's what you reminded <laughs> me of right there. That, um, as a side note, mm-hmm. I, I think Dom was very well spoken, but I also think that was a fine stoppage. It's not necessarily a, a perfect stoppage, but he did eat like what? 12 unanswered punches to the head and it's yeah. it's kind of hard when his hands are both sides of his head and he's not regarding his head and he's like trying to get up but again we had a weird problem that he was getting hit a lot the ref came in and grabbed touched Cejudo and then Cejudo stopped punching him and then Dom kind of started getting up and then afterwards oh, I was getting up it's like would you have been if you, and look to be honest the ref probably could have let him get punched for another three seconds and then the round would be over but that's not the way refs are supposed to operate like the rule yeah. book doesn't explicitly state stop it when an athlete isn't intelligently defending themselves unless there's enough seconds to the end of the round. They just let them get punched a bit more. Like they're supposed to look at it in a vacuum. So, you know, I, I think it was a fine stoppage. I'm sorry, Dom. You, you're a cool guy, but yeah, I think it was a fine stoppage too. I, I wouldn't have been upset if he let it go, but I also, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not definitely not going to cry over the stoppage. No, exactly. And, you know, not every stoppage is going to be a perfect stoppage and there's always going to be some degree of standard deviation, but I'm fine with that stoppage. You know, it's not, um, I'm trying to think of an example of a really bad stoppage off the top of my head, but uh, I like, I don't know, every fight that Mario, uh, what's his name? Mario Yamasaki. Mario Yamasaki. No, nah, he just gives him the chance to be a warrior. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Cause there's all, you know, everybody's got a fighting chance. Yeah. Look, look, when Overeem, they shouldn't have stopped Overeem versus Ngannou because Overeem was, Overeem's toes were curled, but that was just him trying to give a thumbs up with his toes. Look, <laughs> he, was, he was coming back. Like He was, he was going to mount a comeback here. Sooner or later, <laughs> he was going to come back. Yeah, yeah, exactly, or die, either way. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and that's the thing as well a lot of people forget is the, the refs aren't there to ensure an exciting fight. The refs are there to ensure that people are safe. The fight, it should just be exciting as a, as a consequence of them fighting. The refs aren't there to make it. like. That's one of the reasons why I have a lot of issues with, for example, refs standing people up when they're just like, nah, you're not active enough on the floor. Okay, stand up now. And the, the example of that, which I can think of being awful, is when Damian Meyer had um, Jorge Masvidal's back and like got to the position. No, 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 sorry. No, no, it's not Masvidal. It was Kamaru Usman. And he had Usman's back. And it was pretty early in the fight. And he literally just had the back and he was working. The ref was just like, no, 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 no. Just stand up. And it's like, oh my God, what? Why did you interfere? That's awful. Yeah, it's not super entertaining, but there's a semi-decent chance Usman was going to get choked sooner right. or later. There was time in the round. So, that was weird. Yeah. But, hey, is Yamasaki even still refereeing anymore? I haven't, I haven't seen, seen him. In, I haven't seen him in a while. I, I would expect not. Yeah. Um, I maybe, wonder. Maybe. I wonder who he's letting be a warrior now. I don't know. Maybe somewhere in some other promotion. <laughs> but uh, I, I can't. I can't thank you enough for taking the time today. Honestly, and all the valuable information you gave us on the podcast. So I mean, that was oh, that was yeah. super fascinating. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks for having me. It's, you know, it's always fun to actually get on and and talk about this research and this area that you know I've I've invested my entire life into. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, once you so, get all those million papers that you, you say you have in line, we'll have another one. We'll, we'll see what you uh, what you found. Yeah, that's good. I, I think at least two of them, the hydration one and the um, solving weight cutting one, should be before the end of the year. So that'll be, yeah, I think it's a good idea. And then there's also, we didn't get to touch on the, uh, heat acclimation paper today, but that that'll be a good one for the future as well. So, absolutely. I mean, there's so much to touch on. Yeah, yeah. Or well, we could, we not. we could go for the next two hours if we uh, easily if we had to. Yeah. Easily. So yeah, it's great. I had a really good time. So thanks for having me. No, no. Thank you so much. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks a lot. <laughs>